Good evening. This is now my seventh attempt at recording this sermon. There have been technical difficulties all along. I know that it is late to be doing a Pentecost sermon on the Friday after Pentecost, but I really feel like I need to have this sermon posted and up so that my Trinity sermon will make more sense. So, <clears throat> the reading I am concentrating on is from the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound of the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own la native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jewish-born and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. They were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, You Judeans and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your youth shall see visions, and your elders shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have prayed for nine days. We have waited, we have watched, and we have watched a great many horrible things come to us. Now, after, now, after 50 days from the resurrection, the great feast of Easter, we have reached the great feast of Pentecost. The community that had followed Jesus is gathered in the upper room. They are waiting for what is going to happen as the men robed in white instructed them. Suddenly, the room is filled with a sound of a rushing wind and something like 
tongues of fire appear and fill the room, anointing each person there, man and woman. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God that parted the waters of chaos at creation and parted the sea of reeds, allowing the Hebrews to go from bondage to freedom, is blowing full force on this small collection of people. And they are invigorated, enlivened, and set ablaze. Please note, they are not spontaneously learning new languages exactly. They are not pouring out random syllables. They are speaking their own Galilean Aramaic, and they are being understood. They, uh, there are pilgrims gathered from all over the empire and beyond, and they are understanding each what these people are saying as if they were hearing their native tongue. They were no doubt confused. The normal activities of the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, uh, are interrupted by people filled with the Spirit prophesying. To add to the confusion, these are hicks from the back end of the Empire who speak kind of the same dialect as the people in Judea, but it's considered to be degraded but they are completely comprehensible by people who live on the far side of the Mediterranean or from outside the empire, Arabia. One can almost feel the excitement, the befuddlement, and the fear. Do they have a new spirit? No, say the more sober and correct, upright people in the crowd, they're drunk. It's all too easy to play off the breakthroughs of the spirit. Then, as now, the noumenal is scary. It is messy. It is embarrassing. It is often unpleasant. Peter after sidestepping the question of drunkenness, leans into the words of the prophet Joel. What is key here for us now here is the line, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. If for no other reason that that is what the assembled people there were doing, both men and women. In the larger context of Scripture, prophesying is not just foretelling future events. It is also having the veil lifted and seeing the hidden world to see things as they truly are. But most importantly, more important than foretelling the future, more important than the revelations, it is speaking within the grip of the Spirit of God. It is to speak the truth. It is to be the mouthpiece of God. The word prophetic gets tossed around a great deal almost casually. In North America, we have tried to domesticate, pigeonhole, and dismiss prophecy. It is either the act of trying to read the scriptures as if they were the Sibylline scrolls, searching for clues about the divine plan, particularly the last great day. It's trying to line up events and persons trying to figure things out. Or it is to label, use to label the public works of people with whom we agree socioeconomically or politically. 
I think we do this form of domestication for one simple reason. True, prophetic speech is messy and dangerous. It is often risking looking stupid or drunk. And people are often tied up in thoughts of respectability or of membership in a group, whether regardless of socioeconomic level or whatever, you want to fit in. And those people in particular are going to be confused and angered by true prophecy, particularly if they are attached closely with some sort of doctrinaire worldview or political or economic idea and have equated that with their Christian faith. And they will get really angry if the prophetic word does not meet their qualifications. Soon, Peter will discover that the old lines of clean and unclean are no longer relevant. The boundaries of what is acceptable and respectable will and have become irrelevant as well. The apostles are accused of being drunk and they are acting scandalously. That's the hint here. In the church, far too often peacemaking is actually passive-aggressive conflict avoidance. Respecting the dignity of every human being rapidly becomes the humans we agree with, or the ones who do what we want them to do. Hypocrisy rules the day for so many of us in the church. I include myself. Particularly for those in the church who are afraid of offending members or those in power. There is an axiom that the prophet speaks truth to power. It's true. But all too often, we leave it there. And then we also can then label things we like as being prophetic. The biblical prophets, however, called all to repent in the society around them, regardless of rank. St. Francis of Assisi called both the rich and the poor to repentance and penance. He did all that a lot more than he did talking to birds. And it needs to be noted that power in this case is power includes things like power within movements, power in the church, power in society. The prophet addresses not just the official, but the person who wields authority in society, even if that's informal or it's countercultural. Justice and righteousness, mentioned in the Bible, by the way, far more often than law and order, are linked. You cannot have one without the other. To drink of the living waters of Christ is to step out of the ordinary way of things. It is to be alienated from the various states and goals. The word church comes from a Greek word for called out. Christians are called out, out of the culture, out of the norms of politics, out of the moments and movements that surround us. Any other identification is secondary to the Christian. We cannot confuse any political or social construct for the gospel. When we do that, we fail both Christ and the movement that we think we're helping. Furthermore, we make our ideologies, our economic systems, our political ideals into idols. 
This is particularly true and easy when we are ignorant of the history of what it is that comes around us and the history of the church. We must reject the idea that the call of Jesus is to niceness, and we must reject the idea that the gospel is about getting along. We must stop confusing the eternal gospel of our Lord and Savior with the vicissitudes of secular power. We must embrace our roles as the Spirit's mouthpieces and, yes, plunge into messiness. We are not called to be the world's saviors. We are the mouthpiece of the savior of the world. We are called to speak with the energy that created it. But we must never confuse ourselves with the savior. We are the prophets. We are the dreamers. We are the visionaries. We are the inheritors of those bewildered, confused Galilean peasants. And we should stop mortgaging that heritage for the mess of porridge that is the safe, comfortable, nice, and respected lives that we are so far supposed to have lived. We must risk being called fools. We must risk being thrown out. We must risk being considered scandalous. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.